One of the reasons why I chose to study Earth Sciences was to be able to explore and understand the world around me. Our scientific research often requires that we go out into the field, where we collect our data and samples. These can then be brought back to the labs for further analysis. This line of work can take you to some of the most fascinating and remote areas of the world. We chose to explore Greenland. Flight took us over the southern tip of Greenland with breathtaking views of mountains, glaciers, fjords and the ice sheet which extends for 2,400 kilometres north. Stepping foot on Greenlandic soil after months of careful preparation and planning made it hard for some of us to contain our excitement. Greenland is the largest island in the world, 80% of which is covered by a vast ice cap. Despite this fact, it is a brilliant place to study geology. The geological exposure in the areas free from ice is excellent. This is largely due to glacial erosion. The power of the magnificent glaciers carving their way through the landscape created the green valleys and the wide fjords that banished Viking Eric the Red found so attractive when he first settled Greenland. After two flights and one boat journey, we'd finally made it to the settlement of Ialiku. This is where we set up our base camp, where we would be living for the next six weeks. Ialiku is a rural settlement with a small population of around 50 people. The two main sources of income for the community are sheep farming and tourism. The settlement was founded in 1783 by trader Anders Oslin. It is also the site of the historical ruins of Garda, once the seat of the Norse bishop. In the village, there is a small food shop, a community centre, a youth hostel, and even a hotel. A mapping project is a bit like solving a jigsaw puzzle. Piece by piece, you fill in the detail on your map. Creating a map is useful because it enables you to interpret the relationships between rocks and infer the geological history of the area that you are studying. The results of such a project can be very exciting. For example, when you find that a currently calm and peaceful landscape was once home to explosive volcanoes, or you discover that the green valleys were once an arid, desert-like environment. This understanding comes from being able to make observations on a range of scales. From being able to record the geographical positions of outcrops on a map, to describing the rock itself in both macroscopic and microscopic scale. On arriving at an outcrop, we first record our GPS coordinates, locate ourselves on our maps, 
and then set about describing the rock and taking structural measurements. When describing a rock, you are aiming to observe features that allow you to draw conclusions on how it formed and the type of environment it might have formed in. You start by asking yourself, is it a sedimentary, igneous or metamorphic rock? Sedimentary rocks, such as sandstones, are formed by the deposition of particles that have been weathered from existing rocks. These particles can range in size, from mud to grains of sand to pebbles and boulders. These sediments are layered on top of each other, like the layers of a cake. As the sediments become buried, they are compressed, and the heat and pressure acting on them lithifies them into solid rock. For sedimentary rocks, we can look at the shape, size and composition of the grains, as well as any sedimentary features to infer a paleo environment, the ancient environment in which they formed. Igneous rocks form from the cooling and solidification of molten rock. Magmas deep within the Earth's crust cool slowly to form coarse crystalline rocks such as granites. Lava Molten rock reaching the Earth's surface at temperatures of up to 1,200 degrees Celsius can be erupted from volcanoes in violent explosions or flowing red-hot rivers. When they come into contact with atmospheric temperatures, they cool rapidly to form glassy, fine crystalline rocks such as basalts. Metamorphic rocks are formed at depth when changes in pressure and temperature cause minerals to become unstable. When this happens, the fabric of the rock can change. When mapping, it is important to take structural measurements. Strikes and dips of bedding planes are used to draw cross sections through the map. Cross sections can then be used to help us figure out what structures may lie beneath the Earth's surface. Unexpected changes in rock types, fractures and quartz veins are all clues that faulting may have occurred. Understanding the motion on faults, how the stratigraphy has been displaced, can give a geologist information on regional tectonic forces. Reverse faults suggest large compressive forces, whereas normal faults suggest extension. Once you've recorded this information on your map, all that is left to do is to fill in the gaps. You need to make inferences on the most likely subsurface geology to complete the picture. The completed map can then be used to piece together the geological history and timings of events. Greenland is home to some unique geology and some of the Earth's oldest rocks. Our research helped us unravel the geological history of the area surrounding Ialiku. The oldest rock type in our area is the Yulianahab basement granite. This was formed at a destructive plate boundary, where an oceanic plate was being subducted beneath a continental block. Parts of the mantle above the sinking plate melted to produce a volcanic island arc, the root of which was a large magma chamber. Over a long period of time, this magma chamber crystallised to form granite which was then exposed to the surface after millions of years of erosion. The Eriksfjord Formation is a sequence of sedimentary rocks produced by weathering of the granite basement. They were deposited due to the opening of a sedimentary basin during a period of crustal extension and rifting. The sandstones and conglomerates are interbedded with basalt flows, intrusive sills and a tophaceous horizon which formed by large explosive eruptions. These igneous rocks are evidence of crustal thinning, which makes it easier for hot magmas to find their way to the surface. A long and complex history of faulting and intrusion of magmatic dikes in the area is further evidence for crustal thinning. During the rifting, a large alkaline magma chamber was intruded into the crust. This is analogous to the East African Rift Valley today. 
Rob and Anna's project focused on understanding the cooling history of the intrusion. Its composition and mineralogy is unique to southwest Greenland. There is a whole host of these unusual intrusions in the surrounding area, and for decades geologists have been returning to study them time and time again. One such example, Ilamalsak, near the settlement of Narsak, has attracted international attention through mining companies such as Australian-owned Greenland Minerals and Energy. We were invited to visit their site, where they explained to us the significance of the intrusion, which contains one of the world's biggest deposits of rare earth elements and uranium. The company is preparing to get the go-ahead from the Danish government to start mining operations. It has been a controversial topic due to the environmental cost and the mine's close proximity to Narsak. However, when in full operation, the company will bring a multitude of economic benefits to a country struggling with unemployment. On this expedition, I learned a lot about working in a team, living in an unusual environment and undertaking scientific research in the field. But you might be asking, all of this work and no play, not a chance.